So I'll hand you over to our chair, who is uh, Dr. Luisa Piercopo, who is a lecturer in Translation Studies and Cultural Studies here in the School of Modern Languages. She uh, is, amongst many other um, jobs, she um, leads a module on minority languages and translation. She's also a post-colonial, post-colonialist scholar who has studied Indigenous languages in um, Indigenous cultural productions in Australia, and she now researches uh, the Italian diaspora in Wales. Okay, over to you, Louisa. Thank you, Dior Chimay. Hello, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome um, Dr. Daryl Sturk here at the seminars in, organized by uh, our school, um, Modern Languages here at Cardiff University. Darryl, uh, uh, Dr. Daryl Sturk teaches linguistics, writing and translation at Lingang University in Hong Kong. And his research interests include echo translation, indigenous translation studies and film and fiction from Taiwan. He is also a translator and has translated echo fiction by Taiwanese authors such as Wu Ming Yi and Xue Yue. His monograph, Indigenous Cultural Translation, a thick description of Sadiq Bale, uh, is, which is also available in our library, uh, explores the century long translation process that produced the screenplay of the Taiwanese blockbuster feature film Sadiq Bale or the Rainbow uh, Warrior, I think it's called in, um, in also um, a shorter version of the film is called The Rainbow Warrior, which was released in uh, 2011 um, and uh, shown in competition at the 68th Venice International Film Festival and also shortlisted as a contender for nomination for the 84th Academic Awards for Best Foreign Language Film in the same year. At present, um, Dowell is trying to combine his interests in indigenous translation and the great outdoors, for which I believe he is giving us an example in his talk today. And his talk is titled Indigenous Language, Auto Ethno Botany and Translation. Dowell. I'm going to mute myself. Okay. Um, I'll put the, start the slideshow. So um, thanks everyone <laughs> for your interest in my research and um, thanks uh, Russell for inviting me and uh, thanks to Louisa for introducing me. Um, and thanks so much to whoever translated my title into Welsh. And I'm sorry that I've changed it slightly to indigenous language autoethnobotany and uh, translation. I was uh, planning to do this talk in Hong Kong, um, but I've, uh, I came home for Christmas and I've become an Omicron refugee. So it's early in the morning here. And hello from the um, traditional territory of the Comox uh, First Nation on Vancouver Island. On the west coast of Canada in the land of uh, Western uh, Red Cedar on the left and Douglas fir on the right, they're both really easy trees to recognize you can see the uh, trident shaped tassels on the uh, fir cones so i've been um getting familiar with the plants here the one on the left is called stinging nettle and it does sting uh, the one on the left is called dead nettle and i don't dare touch uh, i don't know what's going to happen if i touch uh, dead nettle and um as I get familiar with the plants around here, I um, am dreaming of being back in my field site in uh, Adak land in uh, central Taiwan. You can probably see uh, Usha here, W-U-S-H-E. I uh, study this Adak uh, people who live around there. And this uh, blue line is roughly the route that uh, some Adak people um, took uh, in the 19th century when they uh, migrated across the island to the East Coast via what's now the Taroko Gorge. Actually, Taroko is from a, a Sadek word, Truku, which is uh, one of the dialects of uh, the language. So I'll structure the talk as uh, follows, beginning with my title. So three parts to my title. I probably don't have to talk about it, indigenous language, but obviously it's a sociolinguistic uh, category that uh, depends on what Indigenous means. Indigenous is uh, both objective and subjective. So 
Objectively, it refers to people with deeper roots to a place than settlers. Subjectively, indigenous people have to think of themselves as indigenous. And according to Ronald Neeson, subjective indigeneity dates to the second half of the 20th century. My colleague, uh, Paul Barkley, who wrote the book on the right, uh, has proposed the uh, term indigenous modernity. And part of what he means is that uh, indigenous as a status and identity category is modern. So here's some um, autoethnobotany, and I guess autoethnobiology is the same kind of term. It's a, a term I've coined. Um, we'll start with ethnobotany. According to R.E. Schultes, who is a seminal figure in the study of uh, medicinal plants and hallucinogenic plants in the Amazon River Valley. He described an ethnobotanist as someone who investigates plants used by primitive societies in various parts of the world. So I describe an auto ethnobotanist as someone who investigates plants used by people in his or her own culture. So I coined this term, but it's not like uh, people in autoethnobotany had never thought of the possibility of indigenous people um, studying their own uh, ethnobotany. So this is R.I. Ford's um, chapter, A History of Ethnobiology, and he lists these four um, Native American ethnobotanists, but they're all from the uh, first half of the 20th century, and they're all um, economic botanists, which means they're more interested in the um, objective side of, uh, of plant use. So I wonder what have uh, auto -ethno indigenous autoethnobotanists been up to uh, since uh, around 1950. The, the world's most prominent indigenous autoethnobotanist today is uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer. She's uh, specifically a autoethnobryologist. She's a lady who'll tell you about the 12 different kinds of mosses in your backyard. It's uh, mosses, not moss. And she'll, she can tell you how uh, First Nations uh, in Canada and uh, Native Americans used moss in, in pre-modern times to fill their pillowcases and uh, to dress wounds and so on and so forth. And she's at least a dozen times more qualified than me to talk about uh, Indigenous autoethnobotany but I've got a, an original angle translation. So um, I won't mention any, anyone from minority translation studies. You've probably been reading um, the literature. Um, my hero in translation studies is uh, Roman Jakobson, um, partly for his faith, his naive faith in translatability, partly for his division into, uh, of translation into three different kinds of translation, interlingual translation between languages, intralingual translation within languages and um, intersemiotic uh, translation between sign systems like uh, verbal and visual uh, sign systems, both in your head and out there in the world. So with this, uh, Jakobson basically included all of human cognition and communication within the purview of translation studies. So <laughs> there's a lot more for, for us translators to study, I guess. And with that, I can describe the task of the Indigenous language autoest and botanical translator as being to codify his or her own culturally specific knowledge of plants, which is both procedural and declarative in a process of intralingual and intersemiotic uh, translation. What about interlingual translation? Um, Autoethnobotanists are also translating existing codifications in uh, colonial languages into their ancestral languages, and they're doing this around the world. So this is a, a little bit more complicated than the traditional transmission of knowledge where an elder might simply demonstrate his or her knowledge. Like if I'm going to teach you how to recognize a Douglas fir, not that you would need to be taught, I could just point to the trident-shaped tassels on the, the fir cones, in which case my know-how would be show-how. I could show you what, what I know without any need to say anything. Today, everything is getting talked about and written down as indigenous people translate procedural knowledge into declarative knowledge. Translation and ethnobiology, I've been reading a lot of ethnobiology lately and 
Um, I don't want to imply that these two works are representative. Uh, they're not, but they're a nice contrast in several respects on the left-hand side. The first work is uh, was originally published in 1917. It's about uh, Buffalo Bird Woman who planted corn in um, North Dakota. And as she planted her corn, she sang songs to it. But sadly, nobody in the younger generation wanted to uh, learn the corn songs anymore. So all Buffalo Bird Woman could do was uh, sing those corn songs to her son, who translated them from Hidatsa into English for this uh, guy called uh, Gilbert L. Wilson. He was an anthropologist, a contemporary of Franz Boas. And um, then Wilson uh, retranslated the songs into what he called proper English. And Buffalo Bird Woman went on to articulate all of her plant lore, all of her gardening lore in a 200 page book. And uh, her son translated it all into English and then Wilson translated it into proper uh, English. And apparently nobody thought that translation was a problem. Um, for all Wilson says about translation, the relay translation process was entirely seamless. A hundred years later, this uh, anthropologist Paul Nadasti wrote a book called Hunter Bureaucrats. And by this point, um, translation had become a problem. Nadasti shares Buffalo Bird Woman's uh, concern about the potential disappearance of uh, indigenous uh, tradition. Um, but the problem now is not that indigenous young people don't want to learn about tradition. The problem is that they've become bureaucrats who spend their time engaging with uh, lawyers and scientists. And apparently any attempt on the attempt on the part of these uh, young indigenous bureaucrats to translate traditional hunting knowledge into terms that scientists and lawyers can understand or uh, modern uh, legal and scientific knowledge into terms that hunters can understand is doomed to failure because the two bodies of uh, power knowledge in uh, Foucault's terms um, were incommensurable. Translation had become a problem or even an impossibility. Um, I don't agree <laughs> that uh, translation is impossible or I wouldn't be here, I guess. And um, even with a power imbalance, I think uh, that a translation is possible where you're sensitive enough to the other person, um, the other party to communicate with them uh, without getting assimilated, at least not uh, against your will. So that's not a thesis so much as it is a guideline as I try to answer my three research uh, questions, which are uh, what are autoethnic botanical texts like and why? What are the conditions of translation of these texts? And third, what effects, if any, are the translations having? I could ask, I could ask these questions about any case in the world, but I have to start somewhere. So I'll start with um, the Sa'idic of uh, Taiwan. I'm, uh, more more, film, more familiar with them than with any other case. So um, the, um, the ancestors of uh, the Sa'idic and all of Taiwan's indigenous people have lived on the island for about 6,000 years. They're part of the uh, Austronesian language family. According to the out of Taiwan hypothesis, the uh, ancestors of indigenous peoples of the Philippines and uh, New Zealand and Hawaii and uh, Malaysia, many other places originally came from Taiwan. Um, Taiwan was uh, settled uh, by Chinese farmers. The West Coast was settled by Chinese farmers from the 17th century uh, when Taiwan was under uh, Dutch rule and then Manchurian rule. Uh, and then after 1895, uh, Japanese rule. But um, it was only two decades after 1895 that Sa'idic communities up in the mountains um, finally submitted to uh, Japanese rule. Before they submitted, they lived in uh, small communities of about 50 or so hunters, uh, headhunters, a few farm, a few uh, fishermen, and um, Sweden horticulturalists. Uh, Sweden horticulture is also called uh, slash and burn uh, cultivation, which doesn't sound too environmentally friendly. But uh, in fact, um, Research has shown that uh, Swedens are more biodiverse than so-called pristine forests. And also, in fact, there are very few pristine forests in the world. Uh, this idea of a 
virgin wilderness has been used around the world to uh, justify deterritorialization of indigenous peoples who had shaped the land by living off of it for thousands of years before the settlers arrived. Sadic uh, communities were mostly autarkic, meaning that they were independent. They made most of what they needed from the local uh, animals, vegetables, and uh, minerals. They lived uh, in villages that were at basically sea level to 22 to 20, uh, 400 meters above sea level. So that's subtropical plants like uh, fig trees and uh, up to temperate plants like, uh, like pines. And they also went mountain climbing, they went hunting. And so they encountered plants above the tree line, which are alpine plants. So the plants that they used uh, in their lives uh, ran the gamut from uh, subtropical to temperate. After they submitted to uh, the Japanese, they got isolated investigated and Japanified. They learned Japanese at school uh, until 1945. And then after 1945, when the uh, Kuomintang uh, took over and Taiwan became the Republic of China, things didn't really change that much, except now that now they were Sinified and that included uh, suppression of their languages and cultures. The local indigenous movement in Taiwan got going in the mid 1980s and uh, it was all about uh, cultural and linguistic revitalization and uh, recognition of identity, uh, if not of sovereignty. And so I found this funny uh, comic about sovereignty. How about a compromise? We'll keep, we'll keep the land, the mineral rights, natural resources, fishing and timber and all sorts. And, and we'll acknowledge you as the traditional owners of it. This uh, comic is by a fellow called Magookan, who is a uh, British Australian. So a dozen years after the uh, indigenous movement got going in Taiwan, um, the uh, Guomindang Chinese Nationalist Party uh, realized that they had to be multicultural to have a hope of winning a, an election. So they uh, included indigenous citizens, uh, Yuan Zumin, and uh, indigenous peoples, uh, Yuan Zumin Zhu, uh, a decade later in uh, the mid, mid 1990s uh, by constitutional amendment with a, a mechanism for further recognition. So at the time there were eight or nine, I think there were nine different indigenous peoples, but uh, the Truku considered themselves uh, um, distinct. And so they applied for recognition. They got it in 2004. The of uh, Central Taiwan uh, applied and were recognized in 2008. Um, Truku, uh, according to linguists, uh, Truku is a dialect of, uh, of Sa'idic. They're dialects of the same language. Um, but uh, linguists are not the ones that decide who is who. In a, a settler state, there's a complex politics of recognition. The Indigenous Languages Act was passed in 2017, quintupling funding for language and cultural uh, revitalization. And that's the context for Saedic language, uh, autoeth and botanical translation today. So I, I hope I controlled my time well. And um, that's the end of the uh, introduction. So spend most of my time here on my evidence. and. Um, starting with this Adic uh, Wikipedia, which has been online since last March. And I've, I've been um, trawling it for ethnobotanical, autoethnobotanical articles. And I found three examples, one on Mandarin Orange, uh, Ramey, and uh, Ring Cupped Oak, and uh, different uses of them, different sources. They're translated from written Japanese or uh, oral Adic uh, source or written Chinese source. All right, so um, mudu is uh, apparently the word for jiuzi, as you'll see in brackets, uh, bracketed uh, translation into Mandarin, which is citrus uh, reticulata, uh, which is this guy. It's a Mandarin orange in uh, Canada and, and the United States. And, but according to the dictionary, the Sa'idic uh, Mandarin dictionary, um, mudu is uh, ganju, the two different kinds of citrus uh, trees or citrus plants. Uh, and this is uh, the citrus uh, genus, Ganjushu citrus uh, genus. So the example sentence in the dictionary is, the citrus trees in the old village of uh, Tongan, which is a, a Saedic village uh, in uh, central Taiwan, are all big. In the original Saedic sentence, the uh, predicates at the beginning, subjects at the end, uh, so the trunks of the citrus trees of uh, Tongan village are all very big. 
Um, and uh, mudu here could be singular or plural. I just guess based on context that this is probably probably plural. There's probably not just this one famous uh, mudu uh, tree in uh, in this village. So I start reading the uh, the article and I start scratching my head because there's no mention of mudu. Tsubeo Tsubeo, a long time ago, uh, once upon a time, Nikan Kari Rudan Mesa. Uh, the elders told this uh, story, uh, Nikan Daha Kahido Menakarats. So there were two suns in the sky, two suns in the sky shining bright. Kiaka Mudedengu Ryung Kanaka Deheran. So uh, the land was very dry. Ukabale Pupu Humaun, literally uh, that which was planted, or that which could be planted, um, there wasn't very much produce. Why anu saaduh riung ka dehedan? Because the land was very hard. Mupahua tadi, whatever shall we do? Mesa kanaka saedek si, said all of the people. And saedek here means people or person. Uh, it's only with Japanese uh, ethnographers and linguists that uh, saedek became the name of a people and the name of their language. Nikan ka kingan riso mesa. One young man said, uh, Yaku uh, saon mu tamebu ka kingan hido. I will go and shoot down one of those sons. So I'm still scratching my head because they haven't mentioned mudu yet. Uh, uh, keep reading. So kika maris budi ma paanu na bukwi ka lakina. So he took his son on his back and he took his bow and his arrow and basiak bale ka skadi nikan ka na hido duri. He, for a long time, he sought. The uh, the dwelling place of that uh, second son, Moda Puhuma Mudu Kaleilu Duri Ka Risuni. So this uh, young man who was going to shoot down the sun, he planted Mudu citrus trees or some kind of citrus uh, tree Kaleilu uh, along the path. There was already a path there, so this is not a Hansel and Gretel story. He doesn't plant these trees. Uh, so he knows how to get back. He plants them as uh, food plants, presumably. So he'll have enough food on the way back. So he walks for such a long time that his hair goes white and and the child that he carried on his back is now a, a, a strapping young man. His son, his son shoots the sun down. So the, uh, the sky was very much improved or the weather was very much improved. There's a, a metonym between uh, sky karats and the weather that uh, comes out of the sky, like uh, wind and rain and sunlight. So the, all of the uh, produce of the people was doing very much better. So um, I like, uh, it's a myth that's been uh, filed under under the heading mudu, and I like it for a couple of reasons. It's interesting for a couple of reasons. They didn't have very much, a very high level of technological capability, but they um, they certainly had Im ambition. They had this ambition to change the solar system. And secondly, it's not a story that hunter-gatherer people would tell. This is definitely a story uh, that uh, horticulturalists uh, would tell. Um, about the origin of the of the present day environment that they're living in and how they changed it. So the uh, identity of Mudu keeps uh, bugging me, and I go and check iNaturalist for all of the uh, citrus plants that grow in uh, northern and central Taiwan. And the only one that grows in uh, uh, Saedic land in Renai Xiang is uh, Citrus Maximus uh, Yodzu, which is pomelo, and uh, that happens to be the citrus. Uh, plant that's mentioned in the first recorded version of this story about shooting down the second sun, recorded by this Japanese linguist, uh, Aaron Asai, who published his uh, book in 1935. Right, so this is um, obviously an, an issue of translation, how to translate mudu, whether it can be translated, and um, it's kind of a gabagai problem, if you know uh, the thought experiment in um, in uh, philosophy of, of language, a hundred years ago, if you were in a Saedic village and you asked somebody, what's mudu, and they showed you it, uh, you wouldn't know exactly what mudu meant. It could mean a trunk, tree, a fruit, the individual tree, or it can mean a kind of tree. So you learn the language well enough to know that it's a kind of tree, but it would still take a long time to know exactly what was included in that kind of tree. 
And if you ask somebody different, uh, you get a different answer. And if you asked a sadic person today, their answer might be uh, affected by their modern shopping experience. They can go to the supermarket and get any number of different kinds of uh, citrus. And their modern scientific knowledge, for instance, that uh, the uh, pomelo and the mandarin orange, they belong to the same uh, genus citrus. In fact, I suspect that uh, mudu is typically pomelo or maybe mandarin orange but that it's expanding to include uh, citrus trees in general. Whatever it is, it's an example of a food plant. And um, I was gonna ask you if you could recognize this uh, weaving plant. I just already told you what it is, it's Raimi. Um, Raimi is apparently uh, the name of the plant in Austronesian languages outside of Taiwan, uh, but it's not reconstructable for uh, uh, languages in Taiwan and uh, it's called by different names in different languages in Taiwan. In Saitic land, it's called Kegui. So here it goes, Raimi, Kegui, Kegui, Niwe, as for this uh, plant called Kegui, Pusu Panyahanwari, Yaminu Saitic. So it's where we get our um, un undyed uh, uh, string that we weave our clothing with. Ani ma'anu so tutunun na mkedinwe, so any uh, weaving that uh, women do, hashika nikan wade, you've got to have this, this wade, which is made from uh, Raimi. Egu kalegan ka kegwini mesa rudan mekedin alang. So there are many different kinds of uh, Raimi, according to elderly ladies in the, uh, in the village. And uh, they don't go on to explain this, unfortunately. So maybe this knowledge of all the different kinds of Raimi is uh, gone forever. They mentioned two kinds, kegwi, so the black kegui is the one that we use today. Because, oops, the um, seeds are a little bit uh, black or the seeds are kind of dark. But we tend to nowadays to call it true uh, kegui or real kegui. And I've been reading it autoethnobiology, this is a, a common um, phenomenon around the world in folk biologies uh, around the world. And so what, hap what tends to happen is that people use uh, words meaning something like real or true to modify uh, the name of a, a plant when uh, it's the most familiar example of the plant. So this is kind of the same as the notion of the type species in uh, botany or all of biology, every genus has a type species. So the type species of uh, citrus genus is Citrus medica, the citron, and Raimi is the type species of the Bohemiria uh, genus. Kegui bale, which they mention here is, um, it's kind of like the type kind of Raimi for uh, the Saitic people. Anything similar to the type kind will get called something else like uh, Kegui kaluch, uh, or another example uh, in the last sentence, Nikan Kingan Kesundaha Kegui Rungewe Inidaha Ngali Tutinun Kakia. So there's another kind of uh, Raimi, another kind of Kegui called uh, Monkey uh, Raimi. Kegui Runge, Monkey uh, uh, Runge. And monkeys are kind of playful and they don't listen to orders and you can't tame them. So it's it's a way of talking about things that are growing out, out in the in the in the wilderness. And they don't use it to, to do their weaving. So what's the difference between uh, <laughs> these two kinds of uh, kegui? Uh, the one on the left-hand side is Raimi. So the uh, stipule, the two stipules, and they're separated. And on the right-hand side is kegui runge, the uh, monkey uh, Raimi. And then the, the stipules are uh, joined together at, at the base. All right, so that was... Uh, that was um, an article in, in uh, the Wikipedia with a, an oral source. Uh, Diwas Bowen was an elder who died in 1997, I think. And uh, she uh, told uh, Dakis Bowen here about uh, Kegui and he recorded it. He, Dakis Bowen sadly passed away last, uh, last October. So here's my third example. It's uh, got a Chinese written source and it's a hunting plant. So the source is Alang Tongan, uh, it's the same village that I mentioned earlier, the example sentence from the, um, from the, the, the dictionary about, about mudu, about citrus. Uh, so this is uh, about the plants that live um, around this village. 
and it's written by an anthropologist, the ex-husband of uh, one of the, the auto-ethnobotanical translators that I've been studying, and uh, a botanist, uh, his colleague at uh, University uh, Furindashi. So you can see the leaves have, are serrated at the edges, they're pointed, and you can see it's uh, got acorns, it's kind of oak. It's uh, called the um, ring-cupped oak. That's right. All right, so here's the, the article they divided into a botanical description. Uh, Laos Ni, they spell it wrong <laughs> at the beginning, but uh, oh well. Xieming is Xieming, the uh, scientific name na. Xingang Li, cyano uh, or cyano balanopsis, uh, uh, squercus, uh, glauca, henyega na kohoni mugusama. So it's, uh, its shape or its body. It's a green plant. I don't know what they mean by that. I don't think they mean deciduous and it's not evergreen. So maybe they just mean that there are most plants are green, but some plants aren't. And this happens to be a green one. Tsirana hanni humaneruma wasona nikansu uben. So I, I, I can't see this, but it says that the, the leaves are pubescent, meaning they, they're a little bit hairy on uh, branches that have just grown out. Um, and the um, the heina, the uh, it's uh, meat or uh, it's fruit. He means fruit as well. Mugutumun ma mugutsuki. Uh, so it's got round acorns, round fruit. I think you can see that, and they're shaped like bamboo cups with the lids. So I think you can say that. See that too. That's almost poetic comparison between uh, these acorns and a and a kind of cup. Nikan ubanduri, it says they're also pubescent. They're also got this fuzz on them, but I can't see it. All right, so that's uh, that's Wikipedia for you. I'm also, um, oh, sorry, I forgot. There's an ethno description as well. Laos ni ani inu eguriunga katan mudakil alang nu se'edek hia. So it grows all around se'edek villages. Laos ni parude sa'adek riunga yucheuk. It's heartwood. Uh, so when the tree is big, it's got very hard wood. Uh, so people love this tree because it's got such hard wood. Uh, so you can use it to uh, for the posts in your house. Uh, and when you go trapping, um, you need a piece of wood that uh, has good elastic properties that you can bend it and it'll snap back and catch the uh, neck of a, an animal or the foot of an animal. So you, you can use uh, uh, rouse for, for this purpose as well. How am I doing for time? I'll show you a couple of video oh, sources okay. and then I'll... Okay, okay I'll, I'll, I'll make it quick. This, um, you get tired of reading, you know, so I, I go looking for... Uh, uh, videos and and most of the texts are written by people I know my friends and videos are made made by my friends as well. So this is by uh, Wadandito, handsome guy, ten years ago, Pastor uh, Wadandito, and he made this documentary about uh, plants in uh, the traditional Sadic lifestyle. So I don't know if I have to share my uh, share this. Can you hear? So, sounds a little bit like uh, Paul Simon and the, ry the Rhythm of the Saints. I don't know if they, if they stole the music from that. But he goes and um, visits this elderly lady in the village and watches her process uh, kegui into wade. And she uses this uh, bamboo tool. This is how she processes the... Um, the Raimi, and he noticed she's the one, she's just uh, demonstrating her know-how. This is show-how, and uh, the auto botanical translator, Wadandito, just keeps on talking, talk, talk, talk. So she does that, and then uh, you know, see what Wade looks like when it's done. So just different kind of um, colors. This is what it looks like where they grow it and tend it. And then they sing these songs and I, I thought... 
And I thought this they might be singing songs to the uh, to the Ramy, but they're singing wor working songs to kind of encourage everyone else, everyone who's working to to keep keep working hard. All right, and then he makes another video about hunting plants, including Rao. <laughs> Talk about his hunting lore. That the uh, subtitles are in Mandarin, but he's talking in his dialect of uh, Saitic, which is Doda. Yeah. So uh, here he's saying that other uh, indigenous peoples in Taiwan, they uh, go in hunting parties, but the Saitic uh, go alone. Uh, Mosa. And so um, one of my theses and probably an obvious thesis that indigenous peoples uh, realize who they are and what they're all about uh, by comparison with other peoples. It's only uh, through cultural comparison that they they figure out who they are, they what their identity is all about. And then they go on to, to kind of uh, share hunting uh, lore with, uh, with uh, the audience who's watching TV at home. This is the indigenous broadcaster, Yin Shi, channel 16. So Nika Wainu Nikan Gohoni Britzakba or Brit I can't tell what the last word is. Huangjin, Taiwan Huangjin Bajuam. Yeah, I can't find this plant. So he mentions this plant. It's called we know what it's called in, in Doda Saidic, but we don't know what, what plant it is, at least I don't know. And uh, so he says, where where you find where a hunter finds this plant. And he knows he's going to find uh, Bada, which is, uh, shoot, I've forgotten what, uh, yeah, the Munchak. Bada is the Munchak, and uh, Rukenuk is uh, barking deer. So this is habitat for uh, these two animals, as it says here in the Chinese, Chishi Di habitat. But in, in uh, Sadik, he doesn't have a word that corresponds to habitat. He just says that you're going to find them there. And so here the uh, Chinese translation of the Saitic is fancier than the Saitic. It uses this fancy technical term. Uh, but in general, uh, translation, uh, auto ethnobotanic botanical translation is going to uh, stimulate translators to come up with technical terms in Saitic. It's going to seed the language with, uh, with terminology. All right. And finally, uh, what does Rouse look like? Some this is Raus. Yeah, and that's where you find fly, flying squirrel. If you're hunting flying squirrels, look for look for uh, the Raus tree. Right. <clears throat> so that's uh, that's the videos. I got another video about what Sadic childhood looked like, uh, but I'll just skip over that to, to control time. This is uh, a book, Saida Ke Zhu, Min Zhu Zhu. This is uh, uh, ethnic plants. This is basically Saidic uh, ethnobotany written in Chinese with uh, Saidic translations, bilingual book. Uh, I've been asking people to send me this book or photocopy the book or take pictures of it. Nobody's uh, Nobody has the time, so I can't get my hands on the book. But there's this uh, translation of an article in Chinese about it by Kumu Tapas, another um, Presbyterian. Um, a pastor like uh, what on what on Diro, she wrote this article. She participated in the book and wrote the article. Um, so it's uh, Sadic uh, ethnobotany. And I, I think that the original idea came from the government, or at least the funding came from the government. I'll have to figure this out when I can get back to Taiwan. And um, they divided the plants into 14 different categories, like uh, in terms of different uses. Uh, I would love to know how they did this. I would love to know. Um, how they structured the table of contents that might give some insight on into their idea of how their uh, ethnobotanical knowledge is structured. And um, then they, at the end, she says she hopes that this is going to be a beginning, not an ending. And she talks about both uh, Cree, which is her word for Kegui, Remy, and Rouse. So she says that uh, uh, Bohemiria uh, Nivia is, uh, is uh, Remy, and Bohemiria Nivia. Uh, variant tenacissima, it's a, there's missing uh, A at the end, is uh, Kri uh, Runge or Kegui Runge, the uh, monkey uh, 
um, uh, Raimi, uh, which means that it is similar in shape, but not exactly the same. So her, her uh, botanical description uh, leaves a little bit to uh, be desired. You'll remember that it's the stipules. You, you can tell the two kinds of plant uh, apart based on the stipules. But her uh, description of the uh, various uses of rouse is extremely uh, detailed. And she, she mentions uh, various uh, superstitions. She's Christian, she's a Presbyterian pastor. So um, superstitions surrounding hunting uh, to her uh, or practices surrounding hunting, she, she thinks of them as superstitions. But I don't think you can say that uh, the, the church in Taiwan is uh, suppressing cultures while saving languages. People used to say that. They, they, the church saved these languages, but, but killed the cultures. I think uh, now the, uh, at least some of the, the Christians are, are engaged in, uh, in cultural uh, revitalization as well. The online dictionary with sentences that you can use to double check what you find in other sources. And finally, there's this master's thesis by uh, a Sadic fellow called Umau, uh, who lives on the East Coast and uh, a lot of hunting lore. And then he uh, he's, uses lots of statistics. So uh, men know more plants than, than women do. You can demonstrate this uh, statistically. You can answer questions about men's knowledge uh, versus women's knowledge and uh, ethnobotanical similarity between villages. What would explain it? You could say there's a cultural explanation or it's just the uh, similarity in the environments that they're living in. All right, so do I have any answers to my questions? What are these texts like and why? They're very partial descriptions from a botanical perspective because I imagine the uh, autoethnobotanists have not received very much botanical training. In contrast to ethnobotanical treatises, they mostly simply codify. There's no thesis that they're arguing uh, through these texts. In their codification of traditional knowledge, they leave a lot of blanks that the reader could fill in with uh, hands-on experience. What are the conditions of translation of these texts? Uh, indigenous activists are trying to revitalize their languages and cultures because they aspire towards an alternative way of life, which they hope to pass down through alternative environmental education. What effects uh, are these translations having? I think the translation process is going to have an effect on the language, for instance, by seeding it with terminology. But the texts themselves, nobody reads them besides me, uh, or very few people are reading them, but they could be um, adapted as a resource for environmental education. And, I'll just end with, uh, with that very brief uh, uh, meditation here. Um, here's uh, Western Red Cedar. If I wanna learn about Western Red Cedar, the videos online will tell me how it's different from a, a true cedar, Cedrus. This is true cedar on the right-hand side. Uh, red cedar is also called a false cedar. Thuya is a false cedar. They, they look nothing alike, but the wood is similar. The, the wood from both kinds of trees is, is valuable. But if I wanna know about uh, ethnobotany, I have to, I have to turn to uh, Nancy Turner, uh, who'll tell me about traditional uses of uh, Western red cedar. You can make a tea out of it. Don't drink it too often. You can um, you can eat the inner bark as a famine food. You can make uh, the inner bark into clothing. But if I want to experiment with uh, Western red cedar autoethnobotany or ethnobotany today, it would be probably dangerous, illegal, or illegal. Um, but if indigenous people got involved, uh, it wouldn't be. You know, they could. Uh, uh, hold seminars. I think the Comox people around here have held seminars. I think they've also gone into the classroom and shown young people uh, about the traditional uses of these plants. And um, I think that's uh, that the Sadic people in Taiwan are motivated by this uh, similar uh, concern uh, about their own children being divorced from tradition and being divorced uh, and ignorant of their, their natural environment. And so um, I think they uh, are doing this partly uh, to be able to, to be able to to have something to pass down to the uh, younger generation, to remind them of how Sadic people used to live, and get them back in in touch with uh, their natural environment. So, Sadic childhood used to be uh, playing football with the bladder of a mountain boar or catching butterflies to sell at the corner store, and today, all too often, uh, it's uh, never seeing a butterfly, never never seeing the the starry sky uh, because of light pollution. So, um, so that's uh, that's all I got for you. Uh, probably gone over time. Sorry. Uh, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks so much for for uh, your interest and your attention. Thank you.
Daryl, uh, I think we're doing fine. We have about 10, uh, 12 minutes for questions. Um, if you want to maybe stop sharing your screen. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you so much for, you know, such fascinating and original talk, also visually enticing. And I'm guessing also um, incredibly rewarding on all senses for you in the sense that you probably are able to eat and taste some of these. Not yet, not yet. Um, I, I don't, uh, I'm not brave enough. <laughs> well, I, was, I, I, was, I, was, I wanted to tell you that, you know, you showed a sting nettle. Stinging and, nettle, yeah. Yes, yeah. at the beginning. And as an Italian, I, mm. uh, we make a fabulous risotto with sting nettle. So you just have to arm yourself with some okay. gloves okay. and I'll take your buds, boil it, and there you've got your risotto. You have to make a lot, but it, it's a fabulous result. So there you go. Okay, I'll try it out. <laughs> so um, I'm, uh, um, I've got a couple of questions, but I'm, um, I'm, um, I'm hoping that uh, um, our um, audience has questions. Yeah, you can either raise your hand and uh, and uh, just um, um, enable your mics and camera if you want and ask questions, or you can put them in the chat. Um, okay, so uh, um, let me see. Um, I, I, I found it uh, quite uh, fascinating uh, as, uh, as a scholar of indigenous, uh, Australian indigenous um, um, translation, I, I found a lot of similarities there, but as a Sardinian, a lot of similarities there as well, as a, as a Sardinian and, uh, and a teacher of um, uh, translation and minority um, uh, writing. So you, tell, you told us that the users are not that many, basically, and, uh, and, um, and, and so, uh, um, uh, so uh, and, and they've been um, giving, um, um, you know, children this way of, of, of living. Do you think that they could eventually think of using their knowledge also to, to kind of, I know I'm going that very far, but it's a way of using the languages. Today, one of my students uh, mentioned the fact that if you, if there is a job in that minority language, then, uh, you know, people are interested in learning that language and, uh, and in, in going beyond you know, primary school. So one of the jobs could be probably, I'm just, this is an idea and I'm just thinking if this is actually possible of doing some kind of ecotourism. Uh, yeah, they do. In, you know, There's you know, um, ecotourism in the village and um, they will get elders to explain things in, um, in, in Saedic and then they'll translate into uh, into Mandarin. For the uh, eco tourists, it's eco ethno tourism, <laughs> and um, often the elders are are perfectly able to speak Mandarin, but it's part of the eco ethno tourism experience. And um, um, I I'd, I'd uh, if if I went on the, one of these tours, I'd want them to teach me some of the language. But most uh, eco ethno tourists are not are not up for it. Uh, and I, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, give the floor to An Angela in a second, but just to, to clarify here, how different are is Cantonese and Mandarin from the three different uh, Sadic um, uh, languages? Oh, uh, Sadic is um, Formosan Austronesian language. So uh, Sadic uh, is a lot more similar to Tagalog in the Philippines than it oh. is to Mandarin. Um, I don't. People have proposed a connection between uh, Austronesian languages and uh, Sinitic languages, but the evidence is very shaky and thousands of, of years uh, old. So uh, not very much in common at all. Cool. But I, I talked to uh, uh, Filipino friends and we'll say Babui and they say, ah, oh, pig. <laughs> so they use the same words for, for common things and uh, the where you count and um, some of the grammatical machinery is similar to like an in um, in Saedic is uh, uh, locational um, uh, focus it's called it's a way of nominalizing uh, uh, verbs it's also a way of uh, of choosing as your subject uh, some sort of location uh, and that's just, it's the same in, um, in in Tagalog so there are all these kind of uncanny uncanny connections between um, uh, Taiwanese indigenous languages like Sadic and, and Austronesian languages. 
Okay. Like uh, Tagalog. But, got, uh, got two questions. There, there are a lot of Chinese loan words in, in Saitic, but they're loan words. It's not a genetic relationship. Uh, Angela, do you want to unmute yourself and, uh, and, um, and ask? Sure. Hi, thank you so much for the fascinating presentation. I'm pretty sure I'm going to butcher the name, but um, you may have said this, but I may have missed it. So my question is in two parts. One is who initiated the process of classification of the plans and then of translation of the names. That's the first part, which you may have addressed, but I may have missed it entirely. And the second part is just slightly related. If there is a study on name places and on people's names in Sadiq. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Angela, for your question. Um, the uh, first question is who uh, initiated uh, the process? Um, I uh, I don't know. Uh, I imagine somebody at um, Zhengzhi Dashi uh, might have been behind it. Uh, it's um, one of the national universities in in uh, Taipei. Okay, so um, let me sorry, let me rephrase the question. So it wasn't the indigenous peoples. It was well, it might have been an indigenous person uh, okay. at this university. Um, there's an Atile Gaia uh, at, at the university that studies um, yeah, his his own his own culture and, and he has lots of initiatives that uh, he promotes and says hey we, we tried this in in one village why don't you try it uh, in different parts of the country so it, it might not the original idea might not have been from my my Saitic friends but uh, uh, they they've taken the ball and run with it uh, it takes an enormous amount of energy to uh, to to come come up with material for uh, an ethnobotanical book, auto ethnobotanical book, or to fill, um, to have enough articles on Wikipedia to, to launch uh, an official Wikipedia. So the the original idea uh, may not have come come from them, but they've uh, they've done all the work and they they continue to 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 work hard at this. They have become bureaucrats in a way, like uh, Paul uh, Nadasti's uh, book on hunters and, and bureaucrats. But they're 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 writing all this stuff in the hopes that they it'll help them reconnect and help their children reconnect with uh, with their culture and maybe re reinvent their culture in some way. What was your uh, second question? Uh, sorry, that's okay. The oh, there question. there's is there something on uh, on place names and uh, yes. and personal names? Yes, if there is has been a, a study on place names and people's names, as you know, how sometimes they are there's, translated into the dominant language. So if it has Oh, been yeah, how they're translated. They're, they're mostly uh, trans uh, transliterated. So they'll find um, something similar in uh, in Mandarin, something that sounds similar in Mandarin. Not on place names, but also on people's names. Uh, people's names. Yeah, yeah, they do the same thing. They transliterate it into Japanese or, or Mandarin. Um, People's names often mean something, and often it's plants uh, or features the local environment, like uh, wasp. There's this guy that uh, had the nickname wasp because you didn't want to mess with him. Um, okay, yeah, I, I, I think write that's you really an email. interesting. Uh, uh, totally, I will write you an email because I'm looking at, I'm doing a study on, I was doing a study. On Why don't we uh, get in touch and I, I uh, will. We compare notes? Definitely, thank you so much, appreciate it. Thank you. There's another question. From uh, Kevin Batch. Demo, Demo, how are you doing? Thank you for uh, thank you for attending. We excellent. Um, the <laughs> uh, I like you talking. Oh yes. Yeah, I, I I don't really have a question, but rather a comment, and and that uh, concerns your question of what really what exactly Mudu um, refers to, right? Mm -hmm. I was thinking that Mudu maybe you know maybe there's not one answer to it because yeah. Um, I mean, if you think about it, really, um, and, I, and I compare it to a case, I, I'm from Switzerland, right? And I think here in Switzerland, we have at least three different kinds of maple. But usually yeah. when we say maple, when we use the word for maple, then we refer to the, to the species that's common in our area, right? Mm -hmm. Even though it's also a cover term for several species as well, right? So depending yeah. on the situation, it can refer to a different thing. And really, I mean, if you look at, if you compare what the purpose of Wikipedia is, as opposed to the traditional purpose of the um, Siddiq language, right? I mean, they're yeah. very different because Siddiq used to only be 
really a tool of communication within the culture and natural environment of the yeah. of people, right? And whereas um, Wikipedia is really a scientific tool to describe the world in general. So, yeah. so I mean, I can imagine that, you know, whichever perspective you take, um, there's a different answer to the question of, mu of what Moodoo really means, right? Yeah. And what you could add uh, entries to the dictionary, I guess. You can add what? You could add entries to your uh, to the lexicon. I mean, um, sure, yeah, true. The Moodoo Ballet, which is the one they they're originally familiar one with, right. the one that they used to grow or the that grew around here, and then they say so Moodoo uh, can also mean citrus, and this is uh, in a more modern context. Right. And your exactly. your maple would be maple ballet, I guess. <laughs> That's right. It would be a different. It would be a different uh, maple ballet depending on where you are, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, and, and one more thing that I just thought about um, concerning the last question. Um, so, so one interesting case of a place name um, and the interaction between different languages is the one of Sunuwil, right? Because, because I yeah. think uh, the traditional name of it is Umu, and then it, it got the, um, the um, Chinese name of Chunyang, right? Which doesn't really, isn't really based on the um, original um, indigenous place name. Yeah. But then that Chinese name was translated um, into um oh no no i think that what is it sakura right the the japanese name yeah. that was, you know, the was japanese the, named it sakura yeah. yeah that's where uh Wadandiro is from and i think that's where, where kumu is from as well and mm -hmm. now it's called um uh in what language <laughs> i think yeah it's called uh, sakura but then they came up with um a, an older name uh, yeah, Umu, I think Umu is so, so I'll write that down because um, I saw the question that someone can you guys see that Sanuil yeah. yeah so originally it was Umu um, and I don't know what Umu means just know it as a name um, and then it got the name Sakura which means cherry blossom or, or just cherry in, in Japanese yeah. yeah and then yeah later, this was translated into um, um, the um Sunuwil again which also means um cherry right yeah yeah i like it's inspired by the japanese um, yeah, yeah. and there's a special kind of cherry that grows around there usha cherry yeah yeah and they the way this is an answer to the other question too the way that they um transliterated it into chinese is uh i think uh nu wing I don't know about the first two uh, characters, but the third one is, um, is that the character for uh, Cherry? Snooing. I don't actually uh, know how to translate in Chinese because in Chinese it usually has yet another name, which is uh, Chunyang, right? Which I don't know where it comes from. Yeah. Yeah, Chunyang, who knows where that came from? Um, but uh, Snuil is, is what uh, Wadandira wants to call it now. And when he transliterates it into Chinese, uh, he uses the third character, Ng, is uh, for cherry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he's, he's, it's a transliteration, but he's managed to put the meaning of the village in, in the transliteration. It's smart. Uh, Chinese gives you that option, right? Yeah, With other very clever. From, from English, for example. Um, yeah. like hacker, hacker is hei ke, right? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's it's a transliteration that also means something appropriate. Black guest, right? Yeah. Yeah. Can, yeah. can you tell us how many speakers there are of you know more or less of the Sadiq? Uh... Um, it's uh, hard to know, but um, the the government pub publishes population figures uh, for uh, for Sadiq in Central Taiwan and Truku in in Eastern Taiwan. And it's like thirty to forty thousand. Okay. Uh, I can't remember the precise figure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just um, yeah. but but uh, people more or less can speak uh, if they're older than fifty. It's a grandmother tongue for the most part. Yes. yes. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, uh, maybe ten thousand uh, speakers of Truku and and different different dialects of uh, of Sadic. In, in Taiwan, but there are young people that can speak. There are a few very young children that can speak it very well if they get raised by their grandparents. Yeah. And um, uh, there's a 23 year old who uh, who's completely fluent. And so it gives wow. you hope for the future. Yeah. And uh, yes. when you meet people like this, I'm I'm afraid we have to wrap up. Uh, and uh, and so uh, I um, I want to ask all our our guests to um, sorry all our, the audience to thank. 
um, uh, Daryl for uh, such a, an inspiring and for opening our horizons on, um, on uh, something so interesting and fascinating. Um, thank you so much. And thank you so much for getting up so early for us. Oh, my pleasure. I feel great. Nice to see everyone. Oh, Sonia, hello. Uh, Ileana, yes, yeah, it's, it's uh, it was nice to nice to be here. Nice yeah. to meet you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.